Okay, let's get uh, started. Uh, first of all, welcome you all to the webinar organized by the Circle. My name is Jay Subramanian. I am a faculty with the Department of Plant Agriculture at the University of Guelph. And uh, a few words about Circle. Circle was established in the February of 19, uh, I mean 2020 at the University of Guelph. The full name for Circle is Canada India Research Center for Learning and Engagement. And it aims to be an interdisciplinary nucleus in Canada for cutting edge research on India Canada related uh, um, work, particularly related to Indian diaspora. And about uh, today's uh, speaker, Dr. C.S. Prakash, I mean, he has an extensive resume. And if I start uh, reading all his accomplishments, probably that will be longer than the webinar. So let me keep it uh, uh, short. And uh, Dr. Prakash is currently the Dean of um, the College of Arts and Science at the Tuskegee University in Alabama. And uh, he has been a global leader and has been sought by very many international forums, including the United Nations World Food Prize and all others for uh, expressing the views on uh, uh, GMOs and uh, the advantages of GMO over others and such. And among many other awards he has received, uh, one of the recent ones that is, uh, well, that kind of um, covers all these things is the CAST Award, Communication uh, for Agricultural Science and Technology uh, Award. Um, this is one of the major awards that he received, I believe in 2015, right? 2015, right. yeah. yeah. And he is one of the very few recipients to uh, get that one. And, um, he has been recognized as uh, uh, one of the top 30 social influencers in biopharma and biotech by uh, several journals. And without going on and on about uh, Dr. Prakash, which could be pretty uh, lengthy, uh, just a few words about his research. I came to know him somewhere in 1990s as a graduate student when he came and gave a exemplary talk at the Society for in, in Vitro Biology. And since then, I have been following uh, his growth and he is uh, kind of one of my role models to emulate. Uh, with that few words, I will uh, stop and I will turn it over to Dr. Prakash and looking forward to an exciting webinar session. And for those at the question and answer, please put your questions in the chat uh, since we may not have a lot of time to talk one-on-one, -on -one. please put your questions in the chat and it will be answered on the first come first served basis. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Prakash, all over to you. Very good, thank you so much, Jay. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, this is a, a big honor for me to, to be speaking uh, for the, uh, the circle, an organization that I've come to learn uh, and have uh, considerable appreciation for what work you do. <clears throat> And so I, I want to thank you, Jay and Dr. Sharada Srinivasan and the University of Guelph for giving me these opportunities. I was there a, a few years ago in person at, the, at your beautiful campus. And I wish uh, next time I'll have that opportunity to visit again. And so I'll just go ahead and uh, uh, start sharing my screen and with my slide. In that way, I will... Uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, begin my lecture with, the, with this slide. But what I want to do, as you could uh, look from my title, I, I want to talk about India and Indian agriculture, and specifically on the role of some of the new genetic technologies, uh, what role they could play in improving the food and agriculture situation in India, and, uh, and why the, the, what are some of the potential opportunities that we have over there, and what are some of the challenges, why we are not able to integrate these innovative technologies into the cutting edge uh, agricultural research in the country. And, and then share with you some, some of my thoughts on what we can do about it as scientists, uh, both diaspora and also the, the scientific community uh, within India. And, uh, So many of you uh, who are Indians here in my audience don't need much introduction of India, but um, for a lot of us, India means many, many different things, but India has a, has a great history. 
And it has a great scientific history and not many people recognize that India was forefront in science for literally thousands of years. And uh, our ancient Indians contributed enormously to the global uh, advancement of science and especially mathematics because Indians practically invented mathematics. The idea of zero, the decimal system and how we put the numbers, uh, the, the contrast is the Roman numerals. And what this call is Arabic numerals really came from India. Arabs simply took that idea from India and then introduced it into Europe. And even the heliocentric theory that sun is the center of the solar system around which all the planets, including planet Earth, moves, was there much before Copernicus came up with the theory. It was there uh, in India. And so was the theory of atoms, the plastic, and cataract surgery were invented in India, along with, of course, you all know the yoga meditation and Ayurvedic medicine. And as, as India moved forward from that, and uh, even during the, the, the 9th, 16th and 17th century, under the ru rule of Mughals, India prospered economically. Uh, India was globally, it was, the GDP of India, along with China, was about 50% of the total GDP was just between India and China. And India had about 25% of the global GDP. And then say, after that, it went into a kind of decline. And especially under the colonial rule and highlighted by the, the great famines that we used to have in the 18th and 19th century. And most recently, the Bengal famine in 1943. So while India exported a lot of its agricultural produce um, earlier and was a global power in, in agriculture in India, I think fell into its doldrums for a variety of reasons. And, and once, once the India got independence, it still was in very poor shape, uh, especially in our food production. Uh, Indian, as a child growing up, in the 60s India, one of my most uh, uh, profound memory was our prime minister at the time, uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri, asking us to fast on Mondays, just so that we could conserve the food because simply there wasn't enough food. And this was almost all Indians in, of my age uh, and even younger like Jay would, would remember that. And so if you can see in this, uh, in the slide over here, in, in the 1960, the wheat production, India produced about 6 million tons of wheat. Uh, and it probably, it produced about 25 million tons of rice. And at that time, uh, because of drought, we were, the, the production was so low and, and American, <clears throat> American generosity literally helped keep Indians alive. They were, dozens and dozens of ships bringing food under the PL 480 program from United States to India that helped keep many of the Indians alive. And it was rather embarrassing for a young prime minister, Indira Gandhi at the time. And so when an opportunity came arose in the form of introducing new varieties of crops uh, brought by Dr. Norman Borlaug, she with her uh, agriculture minister at the time C. Subramaniam, a remarkable leader. Together, they put in place, with the help of a very young scientist at the time, Dr. Uh, Swaminathan, uh, the Green Revolution, which essentially transformed India's agriculture, where they introduced not only the high yielding varieties of seeds, of wheat to begin with, followed by rice, but also helped uh, open India's uh, um, the input, the farming inputs, the farming machinery and the credit through the nationalization of the banks and also the starting of agricultural universities uh, along the modeled along the land grant system here in the United States and with a very robust agricultural extension system. So much so that just in the matter of 20 or 30 years, you can see how the crop production continued to increase in India and it was also accompanied a little bit by an expansion of area under agriculture, but also the productivity, the amount of crops that could be produced per acre jumped from one ton 
uh, in wheat to almost three tons and similar increases in the rice. And as we look forward in terms of the green revolution, and these are the, the true, I, I was very fortunate to have known both the architects of green revolution in India, Dr. Norman Borlaug, who visited me at Tuskegee University in 2004, and Dr. Professor Swaminathan, who is still around, he's about 94 years old, and uh, he graduated from the same agriculture college uh, as uh, Jay in Coimbatore, and is still a, a, a great doyen of Indian agriculture, still guiding uh, uh, Indi Indian agriculture. And so today, when we look at India, is literally a superpower in agriculture. Uh, uh, after the United States and in China, India is the third largest producer of food grains in the world. It put from 10 at, at 20 million tons in the 60s. Today, India produces 120 million tons of uh, rice. India produces about 110 million tons of wheat uh, today. And this is remarkable considering India was only producing over 6 million tons of wheat in 1960. And this has led to a, a, a glut of food grains in India and so much so India exports about $4 billion uh, worth of rice. But this is, again, one needs to look at this, but look at the context. While we have increased the production of rice and wheat tremendously, this has been not the same in many other uh, cereals, especially coarse cereals, like what we call as pearl millet and finger millet and sorghum. These are some of the very important drought tolerant crops that feed India and they have not increased. And the maize again has not increased very much. And many of the other crops, especially those grain legumes that help provide protein to the, the large Indian masses because we all tend to be primarily vegetarian and derive our protein from plant sources and they have not increased. And again, there's so much so is the similar story with vegetables and fruits that Dr. J is an authority on, I tell more about. And so the point I'm trying to make is while we have had the Indian green revolution in many ways was lopsided. It was primarily dominated by two crops and in certain regions of India, such as Punjab and perhaps maybe in Tamil Nadu, but many other parts of India did not have the kind of agricultural growth as in the other areas. And so much so that you saw the farmers strike a few months ago in India for a different, diff different reason. Nevertheless, moving forward, India needs to look at its agriculture very carefully and see how we can continue to improve Indian agriculture, considering many of the challenges that face uh, Indian agriculture today. So this is just to show the, uh, the billions of dollars worth of agricultural produce that India exports. Uh, it's close to about $40 billion today. Uh, much of that is marine products, but also rice and spices and cotton, again, thanks to biotechnology. India, which used to be a net importer of cotton, now exports raw cotton to other countries. And there's one uh, guavar gum that many of you may not realize what it is, is this comes to Canada because it goes to your Canadian uh, toy, uh, toy tar sands in Alberta. And this is used in the purification of the petroleum in, in fracking. And this is, comes from a vegetable that it is grown in India. And so India is moving forward in many ways and thanks to the science and technology, but it needs to do more because our agricultural, while it has had impressive growth, but the agriculture constitutes only 16% of India's total GDP. And yet it employs 60% of all the people in India. And so most of them are really underemployed and, uh, and India population is going to overtake China, 1.5 billion people. And India uh, needs to produce a lot more food in a, in a more predictable manner and with less 
destruction of the natural resources because green revolution while it helped increase food production has also had a, a lot of impact on overuse or indiscriminate use of agrochemicals such as fertilizers and pesticides in certain parts of India. And so the current challenges for Indian agriculture is very small holdings and average size of the farm is about two acres and many of the farmers are really very poor and the productivity of our crops uh, despite the impressive gains that we have seen in rice and wheat still in many of the crops are very poor and then we are still plagued you know we are the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world and yet when you go out of the big cities such as Bombay or Bangalore or Chennai you will see very poor infrastructure in terms of the roads and especially as it affects agriculture the storage the cold chain and then the lack of access to the credit in the market then many of the other factors like the climate change that we already see in every part of the world, including Canada, uh, that is going to even make it further the other problems such as diseases, pests and weeds even worse. A lack of value addition, only four or 5% of Indian food is processed. And then there's a lot of state interference uh, into Indian agriculture as price control and transport control and the transport of agricultural goods and then another big problem is most Indian families who are farming now their children just don't want to go into farming anymore and these are all some of the, the issues and so having that in background I just want to see how you know the technological uh, solutions uh, can play a role obviously the, the, the problems here are very complex and the, what I'm talking about is the genetic technologies would not be able to address many of this, except in those instances which affect productivity, such as climate change or diseases, pests and weeds, and then the poor productivity. These are the areas from which uh, improved varieties of crops aided by genomics and other new technologies can help here. And I just want to talk about that a little bit. But before going forward, I just want to remind our audience that if, when, when we talk of modifying food, genetically modified food, you must understand that if, you're, if you don't have an agricultural background, you may not appreciate that almost all our food, every food that we grow today has been modified over thousands of years by a slow selection of uh, uh, picking up the, the good seed and then carrying it to the next generation and through a slow selection, this is how the corn in the Americas evolved and this is how the banana evolved in Asia. And you'll see this example in every crop. But in the past hundred years, we have used more scientific way to improve those crop plants uh, like breeding mutagenesis like radiation and chemicals, but also more recently biotechnology such as transgenics and that is the GMOs where you take a gene from one organism and put it into another organism. Uh, one of the techniques of that is RNA interference. But more recently, we have a, a new technique that has evolved for gene editing and I'll talk a little bit about that too. So the GM crops, the genetically modified crops for which Canada is one of the pioneers along with the United States in developing an adaption of these crops. Also to some extent in India too, now we will grow about 200 million hectares of these biotech crops are grown in more than 26 countries around the world by about 17, 18 million farmers. So this has been a spectacular success, this technology wherever it has been adapted. If you go to Brazil, if you go to Argentina, and the, the whole economies have been transformed by this technology. And Nevertheless, the adoption of this technology has been lopsided. If you go, for instance, in Europe, very few countries grow these GM crops. And in Africa, they are slowly beginning to grow these GM crops, starting with South Africa, and then later Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Egypt. They have just started to, to plant some of these crops in a very small way. And India adopted this crop in one crop with this technology in one crop in cotton, but has not approved uh, any other uh, crop, a GM crop to be grown by its, by its farmers. And nevertheless, wherever the GM crops have been adapted, 
it has provided tremendous benefits in improving the crop productivity, in conserving the biodiversity by minimizing the expansion of area and agriculture, decreased use of insecticides, and reduced carbon emissions uh, because of the less use of equipment on the farm. And so for many of you who may not know what a GMO looks like, this is one but extreme example of, uh, of a photograph my friend Wayne Parrott from University of Georgia took this picture in Honduras of one very poor farmer who's growing corn. If he did not spray pesticide in a normal unmodified corn, this is what it would look like because of the attack of the insects. And you can see how a biotech corn would, would be completely free of the disease. It has a, a single protein that is produced from a gene from a bacteria that keeps it very healthy and nevertheless very safe for animals and humans who eat this corn. A similar example of soybean uh, with a similar gene uh, in the laboratory, you can see all the, la uh, uh, the insects migrate to the non-GM soybean where the GM soybean is left very healthy. And this is again a cotton um, from Australia, it looks dear night. I don't even need to label which one is GM cotton here and which one is not. And so when this was introduced into India in 2002, it proved very popular, so much so about 95% or 98% of the Indian farmers grow this cotton. And since its introduction, Indian cotton productivity has more than doubled and the pesticide use has come down dramatically in, in, um, more in uh, literally two or three million Indian farmers who grow that. But nevertheless, when India tried to introduce a similar technology in brinjal or eggplant uh, in India, which is a very, very popular vegetable, uh, there was a, a tremendous uh, opposition to that. It was primarily orchestrated opposition, but nevertheless, the minister at the time, Jairam Ramesh, the environment minister, put a moratorium on, on the commercialization of this crop. And so this particular technology was adapted by the, it's India's neighbor, Bangladesh, and it has proved very popular since its introduction six or seven years ago. So much so hundreds of thousands of Bangladeshi farmers benefit from, from this technology where they don't have to use any pesticide and yet get a clean crop. And slowly this technology is spreading into other countries such as Africa, like you see the cowpea here. And, uh, and they're also experimenting with uh, potato very important crop in Africa. And you can see in Uganda, a friend of mine sent me this picture, Dr. Kigundo. In the experimental plots in Uganda, every potato plant that has survived here is a genetically engineered potato. And all the gene that it has is from one single gene from another wild potato that you can see from Dr. Jonathan Jones of John Innes Institute holding here. Similar research is going on in plantain and bananas. Uh, again, it's very, very important source of uh, calories in uh, Africa. And, uh, and banana is very difficult to breed, as you can imagine, because it has no seeds. And yet, uh, by using genetic engineering, we can easily improve banana very quickly. Uh, papaya, a very important crop that was grown in Hawaii, was completely eliminated by a, a nasty virus. And it was uh, 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 recitated. Uh, rescued by a, a genetically engineered papaya that means 100% of papaya grown in Hawaii now is GM papaya. And scientists are also trying to bring back chestnut, a, a beautiful, magnificent, majestic tree that was there all around the United States and Canada, eastern part, uh, and was destroyed by a chestnut blight. Now there is, uh, through genetic engineering, scientists in Syracuse uh, are trying to bring that back. And just to show an example of how genetic engineering can help. Another example is to in introduce vitamin A into rice, but also other crops such as maize and soybean. Uh, and vitamin A deficiency is very nasty and it can help. But also when you consider 50% of all of our fruits and vegetables in India goes bad because of lack of storage and lack of processing and refrigeration, uh, trying to delay the ripening of tomato 
would be of value from, of most of the vegetables. And again, by, by silencing the ripening genes, we can do that. Uh, also technology to, to reduce browning in potatoes and apple. These two are already released in the United States and Canada and it's proved very popular. And also to growing uh, pharmaceuticals. And Canada again is a leader in uh, now producing uh, coronavirus vaccine uh, in, in Quebec. And a, a company called Medicago is doing that. And a similar research that was done to produce uh, antibodies against Ebola help bring down this disease. And so there's quite a lot of applications of uh, genetic technologies, including developing a beautiful rose or a beautiful looking pineapple. But the biggest problem when it comes to GMOs is really not the technology or what it can do, but it's its acceptance because well, it's kind of like Rodney Dangerfield. It has a very poor image in the, amongst the public, amongst the, the policymakers and the media. And, uh, and that is why it's very important for us scientists to, to help to clear many of the myths and misinformation against GM food, particularly when it comes to its safety and then help them understand that it is as safe as conventional food and it's very highly regulated and we have not had any problems in the use of this food. And nevertheless, there's one technology that has just arrived on the scene that whose inventors got the Nobel Prize last year called gene editing that is creating a lot of amazing wonders in biomedicine, like curing sickle cell anemia, even uh, helping the blind mice see for the first time, many, many things like that. Even talk of curing the cancer through genome editing. And we also use this technology in the plants and this is simply unlike GMOs where we introduce a foreign gene here, we do not transfer a foreign gene into it, but kind of like how you do the editing of your text messages on your cell phone through auto editing, we can just edit some of the nucleotides that are causing bad diseases and improve that without you using sophisticated uh, gene transfer technologies that are involved in uh, GMOs. And so this particular one of this technologies for CRISPR technology was the one that got the Nobel Prize is proving itself very popular also in the use in, in agriculture, both crops and livestock. Just to give an example of its application, for instance, in tomato, just by altering a few nucleotides, they were able to make these tomatoes that were quite susceptible to a disease called powdery mildew into a resistant tomatoes. And the similar research also done in rice where they were able to, to create resistance for a, a nasty uh, disease called bacterial blight that literally cost billions of dollars worth in all the rice growing regions in Asia. And they were able to develop resistance in just in a matter of few months. It's a very precise technology very rapid and is also can be used in uh, uh, improving productivity in, and in many, many uh, applications of that. It's finding it's one of the hottest technologies right now with literally hundreds of pub papers being published on a daily basis. And the tomato that I showed you of fruit ripening with GMOs, we can also do that by slowing down of some of the fruit ripening genes through gene editing and uh, this is another one uh, example where they were able to, to slow down the cell wall degradation enzyme activity in tomato so that it could stay fresh for a long time. And again, another example of tomato with high lycopene content that is uh, known to help men uh, in preventing prostate cancer. And also you can change the architecture. When you recognize that G, the green revolution happened uh, simply because of alteration of just two genes of related to dwarf stature in both uh, wheat and rice, uh, the similar uh, stature architectural changes can be easily be made uh, using gene editing. And here again, a tomato, uh, uh, example that that uh, that was shown before, and again talking about uh, global warming, 
with its impending problems of drought or even water, the flooding or heat, CRISPR and gene editing technologies have tremendous potential to help improve our crops to make them more hardier and just make them more climate ready in the face of this. Many other traits that could be altered make our rice more diabetes friendly, with a, make them more with a low glycemic index. And of course, this is something um, many of us would love, would say an improved beer uh, with the gene editing that was uh, done in Australia. And uh, Japan just approved these tomatoes just last week. And uh, these are called high GABA tomatoes. And apparently they are quite helpful in, uh, in reducing your blood pressure. And so these are all the kind of fancy products that for consumer friendly with specific applications for consumer uh, uses are coming along. Even the golden rice that we saw earlier, uh, it could be, it has been done not with the transfer of genes from maize as you saw earlier, but with uh, simply turning on the existing vitamin A, pro-vitamin A genes within the rice. Uh, the gene is present in the, the rice endosperm, but it's not turned on. And by genetic editing, we can turn it on, not just in rice, but also in the banana that you see here. And so there are many, many such gene altered, uh, gene edited plants are now being either grown in the United States on experimental basis. They've also, it, because of, they are not regulated as regulated as GMOs, they one needs to simply check with USDA to see if they need to provide regulatory information or with the Canadian, uh, 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 Canadian regulators. And so they have a very small regulatory footprint and so much so that many small companies are producing lots and lots of products and the list really goes on uh, that you can see with improved taste, a better improved malting barley, uh, canola with low phytate and tomato that helps in mechanized harvesting, better tasting mustard, high yielding potato. And so the list is literally, if you look around, there are hundreds and hundreds of traits being modified and through a variety of uh, very fundamental intriguing mechanisms at the molecular level, what this technology can do for which I just don't have the time to explain. But nevertheless, the gene editing is going to be increasingly popular because it's fast. It doesn't cost as much, uh, uh, because especially because there are low regulatory burden. And then and the opportunities are endless as to what it can do with it. And so uh, when you apply these technologies in Indian agriculture, it can help improve crop productivity, improve developed crops with climate resilience, reduce pesticide and fertilizer use, extend the shelf life for fruits, improve the food quality, eliminate, eliminate a lot of toxins that are present in our food. And overall, I believe it will help in increasing the farm productivity. And today there's a big uh, day because the United Nations talking about the food, there's a food summit going on, all the global world leaders from 100 and 22 countries are talking about it. I'm also involved in one of the committees that way. And so as you can see, I hope they will, they will see that we have these tools and these tools are not being used for not because they are not safe, they're not safe, but just because of the perception on that. And so this is the, well, those countries that are green here have widely accepted this technology Many countries, including red and yellow, are sitting on the fence when it comes to this technology. And so we do have a, a moral obligation to help advance understanding of this technology. The government, like China, has already come very forward and spent more than $100 billion in, in support for gene technologies. And we need to streamline the regulatory system and then academic scientists like Jay and myself, we need to continuously speak up and Indian seed industry, you know, which has really benefited billions and billions of dollars from BT cotton really doesn't done any much basic research, needs to chip in and to research on areas such as gene editing 
and there are a lot of stakeholders. We need to engage them, work with them to see, help them understand the technology and its benefits and its safety and use tools such as social media to, to, to bring about a change in the understanding. And finally, well, I want to close uh, my talk by saying that, you know, historically, if you see there are many, many technologies uh, have, have, have always had a delayed acceptance, pasteurization, it took like 100 years before it was accepted by the public. Uh, look around canning, preservation, uh, even microwaves and use of irradiation in uh, food safety, all of them. And so the, the apprehension with GMOs is, is not very surprising, but what is important is that we must help the society understand that these technologies can provide solutions to some of the problems facing agriculture in countries such as India. And we need to be very open-minded in evaluating that. And we should not just dismiss them based on some emotion or some what some activists somewhere, such as Dr. Vandana Shiva, who has been very opposed to that, says about it, but look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and make that individual decision based on science and based on reason and based on data. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you, Prakash. Uh, uh, questions can be posted on the chat. I think we have a relatively small audience. I have one question from Bharat, uh, which is something that even I had. What is the importance of science communication and journalism, especially in the biotech field in India? I'm sure you will agree with that, that the com science communication is generally poor, not just in India, but in many parts of the world, but particularly in India, what are your thoughts as Bharata? Exactly. I think it is even more important in India because there's a lot of pseudoscience in India that, uh, you know, even uh, when I go back and a lot of, I, I started working in Indian, Indian Institute of Science, some of the most premier uh, institutes in the world, uh, globally ranked uh, with uh, a Nobel laureate, Dr. C. V. Raman, used to be the director of that institute. And even, even in, in, a, in such an intellectual place where you find so many members of National Academy of Sciences and fellow of Royal Society, there is a certain, uh, there is easy, Indians tend to indulge in pseudoscience and just harking back to our past and bringing Mahabharata Ramayana into our conversation. And, and so, uh, and current, and again, with the current uh, uh, head, uh, Modi and the RSS being very dominant in India, had, there is a resurgence of the past pride, which is good because I started my slide with what a great uh, past that we have in science in India. But what is important is to make sure that we try to separate some of those uh, myths and mythology from, from science. And that is where science communication, beyond science communication, it is the rational thinking amongst Indians that is, that is very important. Because even during the COVID pandemic, I'm sure Jay, you used to get WhatsApp messages and all kinds of treatments like COVID, right? <laughs> that you smell, you know, you just have a steam inhalation or you put some uh, lemon in your uh, nose or whatever, you see? So there is a, quite a lot of such things that happen all over the world. And, and that is where uh, having science communication and uh, uh, trusted voices of science coming along, like Dr. Schwartz in Canada, for instance, who has been at the forefront in fighting chemophobia, uh, is, is, is going to be very important. So I cannot uh, you know, emphasize that enough in terms of science communication. On the same tones, who you should, uh, who you think that should take the lead on science communication? Is it on the scientists, or it should be on the journalists to take it up? I think because you have very few scientists like you who can go and talk, or who is invited to talk in several uh, higher forums. But who should be bearing the charge for this one? Right. I think because the knowledge of this. You know, this is a technical issue when you're talking about the safety of uh, coronavirus vaccines, COVID vaccines. Only the scientists can understand why, where the safety is. Those who have done clinical studies 
are those who and those who have developed. And so the first, uh, the in, initially, the communication should come from the scientists, uh, but the journalists have a, 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 a even greater role in transmitting that communication because they are the ones who can who take it to the public. And we have very few, uh, as you said, there are very few scientists of the stature of uh, you know that we see on the on the media uh, that that are in the that even when you ask a layperson, can you think of any scientists? Very few names come to their mind, but they can. Uh, but then there are many others. There are trusted people in the public arena who could who could talk about these things. I, I, I remember, for, for instance, uh, uh, in the United States, there was a big controversy about Apple. That was 30 years ago. There was a large controversy. There was one news media by 60 Minutes that said this is carcinogenic. They spray this. And, you know, this is a you are a plant physiologist and you know. And as a, and a fruit scientist, what alar was used uh, in in uh, is using the ripening of apple, right? Yeah. It is to promote ripening of the apple, and there was absolutely no evidence that it it was posed any harm to people. And yet, based on some hearsay, they, uh, and the, the sixty minutes put it up, and there was suddenly people stopped eating apples for the fear. And uh, the J. Everett Coop, who was the Surgeon General at that time, then came on a series of television interviews and said, look, that's all nonsense. There's no problem with Allah and it is safe. And the controversy went away because they trusted this person. Although he was not a plant scientist, he was not an Apple researcher, but nevertheless hearing from somebody whom they trust yeah. was very critical in, in getting the controversy to in ending that controversy and so we, we need such spokespersons yeah exactly uh, there's another question here uh, uh, very key issue which is uh, uh, kind of uh, stopping or slowing down all the progress in india is who owns and controls the technologies right is food sovereignty under threat because of this monopoly that is perceived Right, I know. I know that's that's a that's an important topic. Topic, and I'm I'm very familiar with that, and uh, that has been, uh, you know, this has been uh, has been advocated as one of the reasons why we should not be uh, embracing this technology because com country companies like Monsanto, you know, which doesn't exist anymore, but it has now been bought over by Bayer. Mm -hmm. They control the technology, and so. If we just get uh, into, you know, if we just accept this technology, then we would become subservient to them. They will control the country by controlling the food. You know, look, look at 30 years, what has happened. You know, Monsanto was the dominant and it still is through Bayer. And we, they came to India for BT cotton in 2002. And what's happened? You know, what happened to the cotton? Cotton, there used to be a handful of cotton varieties that were being produced. And today, if you go to India and you can have something like 250 varieties of cotton with BT genes uh, that are available. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the, the technology providers, uh, when they provide out of 750 rupees for one packet of seed, the amount of money that goes to Monsanto, which provided the technology is really six rupees, mm -hmm. okay? And it's very minor, and then it's only for 18 years. And so this, all of this uh, thing about food sovereignty, food uh, it has been, you know, has been exaggerated and blown up beyond proportion. Well, there is an element of uh, some ownership of that, but as long as we have good laws and uh, good monopoly and manage that, I'm not saying these companies are good intentions. You know, they are all here to make profit, just like Facebook or any any mm -hmm. company, Apple, any of them that we need to control and regulate them. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we do not benefit from the technology that Apple or Facebook provides by by fe by fearing on what they can do. We just need to be reasonably informed as to what are the the limitations when we bring in those technologies and how we can manage that. Okay. Another question, in fact, it is a, a series of questions, but all centering around uh, uh, the same point, more or less. Mm -hmm. 
why there is so much opposition to gmo in india is it <laughs> legitimate or is it just a speculation or is it fueled by uh, poor communication and where is it coming from and why is it still lingering in, in spite of all these technological advances right if you ask the farmers who are growing these uh, they're not worried about it because they know they live with it uh, if you go you know uh, have a very good friend uh, mr ravi chandran mm-hmm. a, a farmer uh, about uh, 100 miles from coimbatore has 30 acres of cotton since last 20 years he has planted cotton and you ask ravi uh, are you worried about it he said absolutely not and you ask him why are you growing this monstrous uh, frankenstein cotton he says that has made my life uh, much better by growing this cotton that he is able to get uh, you know much more income he he doesn't have to spray this uh, deadly pesticides anymore on the farm and also the cotton seed oil remember is used it's a food so cotton is not just a crop was a fiber crop but um, it is one of the largest uh, cooking oils in the world where they remove the Uh, the, the the chemical the gossip all within that and then it is a very healthy oil and so it's used all over india without their knowledge and yet the 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 opposition to gm foods comes from a handful of mischief mongers uh, <laughs> who simply you know and you know many universities including guelph invite many of them uh, these people from india uh, give them 25000 speaking fees and they insist on flying first class and they come and spread uh, and talk nonsense um <laughs> saying that we indians need to keep be kept backwards we need to be you know use only growing our crops with uh, cow manure and we don't need any new uh, innovative technologies which is not which is not right which is not correct any countries like india and china need innovations innovative technologies more than canada and the united states because we have the the you know larger population and a very small amount of land and so much other problems that i've described and uh, that is what is really fueling in india it is not because of factual uh, evidence that there's any problem with these crops it's also combined with fear of uh, foreigners and as you, i remember in bangalore when the first kentucky fried chicken was opened <laughs> uh, a group of <laughs> thugs yeah. came and put stone to that and now uh, if you go to bang you know if you go to india uh, it's just like you are in some part of united states in terms of choice of the food that you can get and so again many of those concerns that were there initially against uh, outside control uh, have all uh, vanished the yeah, other question is also very interesting in the sense that you know european countries are equally advanced as america or australia why among all those so called developed countries why is there so much resistance in european countries not encouraging the gm crops as much as uh, america or australia or uh, china right does? that's an enigma and it's a very good question uh, there is there is a, a variety of reasons for that and the, it really it's because of european union european union kind of made inwardly of the 27 countries that came together made single policies for the whole europe and so it kind of stopped the divergence of opinion on that and just look at england now 3 years ago it got out of the european union and today england is moving forward it is testing gm crops now for the first time and it has publicly said that they are going to um, eliminate many of the regulations that are there for gm crops for gene edited crops and so england is moving forward but europe is not technophobic remember this uh, moderna vaccine was, was developed in uh, here in the north america but Uh, the counterpart the pfizer vaccine was developed uh, in germany and uh, biotechnology is very thriving in all over europe and biotechnology products uh, are in those instances which matters to europe like cheese you know it's so central to the european culture do you know that 90% of all the cheese made in europe uses genetically modified enzyme uh, chymosin yeah. uh, and uh, and then 99% of all the insulin 
consumed in Europe comes from genetically engineered organism. The reason where they are not promoting GM crops is primarily because of politics. European Union, uh, half of European Union's budget goes in paying its farmers not to grow crops, you know, because they're just, just a glut of food production. And the farmers are worried that if GM crops come, their subsidy would end. And there's also when this was started in the 1990s, GM crops got a bad name because of the way Monsanto handled it. And there was a mad cow disease coming along over there, uh, which, uh, you know, which was associated with GM crops for some reason or other. And, and so anti-Americanism also played a role in why Europe went its own way. But trust me, if tomorrow, if European um, like grapes in France uh, it gets uh, lost or potatoes in Ireland gets a disease again, they have the wherewithal and technology to bring back GM right away. And, uh, and so Europe is not far from using GM crop technology if, it's, if it is necessary for them. So another interesting question is where and how did this conspiracy against GM emerge? Can uh, anybody trace the roots of it? Well, yes, yes. <laughs> you can trace it to one individual in Delhi called Vandana Shiva. And before, <laughs> and I have a few people like that. You know, I'm sure I can name, uh, you know, it's a lot of Canadians uh, uh, who, who have contributed to that, uh, including uh, uh, Suzuki, um, who in the, it's a handful of people uh, and, uh, and who is that farmer in Saskatchewan they made a movie out of that um, <laughs> I mean I know I met him I'm suddenly <laughs> not able to remember his name and so it is truly a handful of people and also a great Canadian uh, institution uh, export to the rest of the world called Greenpeace um, also helped in, in creating this misinformation against this technology for self-serving reasons. And, uh, and so this was a very deliberate and it was highly orchestrated and it was well-funded uh, yes. the opposition, but it's very sad though. Uh, one final question I have here is, uh, this is something you know everybody can uh, kind of relate to. People accept insulin, which yeah. is coming from a genetically modified uh, enzyme basically. But why not brinjal, for instance? This is particularly true in India. That's true. And again, you know, uh, I must acknowledge the great Canadian uh, contribution in the discovery of insulin uh, 100 years ago that, uh, that uh, saved literally hundreds of millions of lives today. Uh, today. And, in, and insulin was one of the very first genetically engineered product to be commercialized way back in 1983 by Eli Lilly. And, mm -hmm. uh, and still today, as I said, 99% of all the insulin is genetically engineered. It's, I think people have a hypocritical attitude when it comes to food and when it comes to medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 people will eat and we will take anything if it helps cure them. You see what I mean? Yes. But at the same time, when it comes to food, uh, you know, we, 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 we believe we have a choice so we could we have the luxury to to say no, and so I, I think there is again, and um, we we must try to help the people understand the the safety uh, of uh, this technology and the benefits that it can bring, and I'm quite confident that over time people will get begin to understand that, and this controversy would just simply go away. Okay, I don't think there is any other questions. Any other questions from the remaining audience? We, we have uh, three or four more, five more minutes. Okay, if not, thank you very much, Prakash. It was, uh, as, as always, a very enterprising, uh, uh, enterprising talk and very enticing. I hope some many of these students and others in the audience got some very good information on uh, genetically modified organisms, what are the misinformations that are going on. And once again, thank you for taking time amidst your busy schedule to come and talk to us. And our next event in the uh, Circle webinar will be presented by Dr. J.G. Varghese, and this is next Wednesday. And that would be on strategies for increasing rigor in community engaging and learning.
okay thank you all for joining and have a very good day and a good rest of the week and stay dry thank you